I'm here to discuss the Supreme Court's decision in Dudenhofer versus Fifth Third Bank. Uh, this was a lawsuit filed under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, also known as ERISA. ERISA is the federal statute that governs most private employers' employee benefit plans. Among other things, ERISA requires that the people who manage these employee benefit plans are subject to various fiduciary responsibilities. And in the context of retirement plans, that includes a duty to select prudent investments. So in the Dudenhofer case, participants in uh, Fifth Third's 401k plan allege that the fiduciaries of the 401k plan breached their duties under ERISA by allowing participants through the 401k plan to invest in company stock. Uh, these types of complaints are known casually as stock drop complaints. And the reason for that is that uh, they stem from a decline in the company stock price, um, either through some kind of an industry downturn, perhaps a failed business plan, uh, it could be a variety of cir circumstances that lead to the stock price declining. And in some circumstances, the plaintiffs will allege that the stock was artificially inflated. So in other words, there was some kind of insider information that the fiduciaries were aware of, but that they weren't disclosing to participants or to the public. And that led the stock to trade at artificially inflated levels, which meant that when the truth was revealed to the market, the stock price declined, and that was the source of the decline. In either of these types of scenarios, though, in the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen a lot of complaints challenging employer stock as an imprudent investment in these types of retirement plans. Uh, the Dudenhofer plaintiffs originally filed suit in 2009. They claimed that uh, various information regarding Fifth Third's involvement in the subprime lending market um, ultimately led the stock to be an imprudent investment for purposes of ERISA. At the district court level, the court dismissed the complaint without allowing the case to go forward into discovery. It, it found that the plaintiffs had failed to allege facts that uh, Fifth Third stock was an imprudent investment based on what's become known as the presumption of prudence. Uh, this is a presumption that um, all of the appellate courts that had considered the issue had decided uh, did apply to investments in employer stock in the ERISA context uh, when you're dealing with either what's known as an ESOP, that's an employee stock ownership plan which is uh, designed by its terms to invest in company stock, um, or some other form of eligible individual account plan, um, which is any other type of plan in which uh, the participants have their own accounts, they can select what to invest in, what not to invest in, etc. And so courts had applied a presumption of prudence to investments in employer stock uh, based on various provisions in ERISA that actually encourage um, employee ownership. Congress wanted to encourage employee ownership when it enacted ERISA, and, um, and so there are various provisions of ERISA um, that exempt fiduciaries in ESOPs or these eligible, uh, eligible individual account plans from certain ERISA requirements that might otherwise apply. So um, the district court dismissed the complaint for failing to overcome this prudence presumption. Uh, it went up on appeal to the Sixth Circuit and the Sixth Circuit reversed the dismissal. Uh, the Sixth Circuit was the only circuit uh, that had ruled that this prudence presumption um, could not apply at the pleading stage. Every other circuit that had considered the issue um, had been willing to apply this presumption at the pleading stage, although there was some disagreement as to what an ERISA plaintiff would need to allege in order to overcome the presumption. A lot of courts required that the plaintiff point to uh, some really serious circumstances that would uh, suggest that the company was on the verge of collapse. So we saw terms like dire circumstances, on the verge of collapse, and that type of language in court opinions um, that had uh, applied the prudence presumption. So uh, the Supreme Court decided to review the issue, and initially uh, the court was going to decide only what what facts a plaintiff must allege in order to overcome this presumption. 
at the pleading stage in order for the case to go forward into discovery and be decided on a, um, a broader record. Um, but the court ended up taking a step backwards and, and actually deciding that this prudence presumption does not apply at all in the context of ERISA investments in employer stock. And, um, and the court recognized that there are provisions of ERISA that do encourage employee ownership and that that was an important congressional goal, but it found that those provisions were, were not enough uh, to give rise to a presumption that, um, in the court's view, didn't have a statutory basis. Uh, the court also acknowledged that in many of these types of plans, uh, the, the plan is written to mandate that the stock be offered as an investment. And so one of the reasons that courts had applied this prudence presumption was that fiduciaries find themselves between a rock and a hard place because they're obligated to follow the terms of the plan. But if they, if they continue to abide by the terms of the plan and to allow the plan to continue to purchase and to hold company stock when the price is going down, then they'll face lawsuits like these. On the other hand, if they go ahead and sell off the stock or close it to new investments uh, when the price declines, then they're likely to face lawsuits by plan participants if the stock price goes up again. And there have been those types of cases on, on the flip side of the coin. And so that's one reason why courts had applied the presumption. And the Supreme Court acknowledged that that was a legitimate concern, but found that that, that also didn't give rise uh, to the application of a presumption that would put company stock on separate footing from other investments under ERISA. So, uh, so the court um, declined to apply um, any presumption at all, um, and, and then it, it set forth to provide some guidance to district courts as to how to evaluate these types of complaints. Uh, one of the key issues presented in these cases, because they most often involve publicly traded companies, is that the information that the plan participants say gives rise to a duty to uh, sell off the stock from the plan or to close it to new investments, um, that tends to be non-public insider information. And it's information that the fiduciaries tend to learn in their capacities as corporate insiders. Well, if they were to sell off the stock in order to protect the plan participants from suffering any losses, uh, that would violate insider trading laws because in effect they would be putting plan participants ahead of the interests of the rest of the market investing in the stock who don't have access to that information. And so most courts uh, that have considered the issue ha had found that there's no obligation under ERISA for a fiduciary to engage in insider trading. Um, and, and the Supreme Court agreed with that and said that to the extent a plaintiff is alleging based on uh, excuse me, first it said that based on uh, public information, uh, any claim suggesting that a fiduciary should know that the market wasn't appropriately pricing the stock, in other words, maybe the market was, uh, maybe the stock was trading at $20 in the market, but fiduciaries should have known that it was really worth more than that and less than that or less than that, the court said that those types of allegations are implausible. Uh, unless a plaintiff can point to some kind of special circumstances that would give rise to um, a, a finding that, um, that the market w was not appropriately pricing the stock. On the other hand, to the extent that a plaintiff is alleging that based on non-public information, uh, that the fiduciary should have sold off the stock, should have closed it to new investments, or should have disclosed the, the bad information uh, to plan participants in the market at that time, that uh, courts, you know, courts need to take a, a close look at those allegations to see whether uh, the complaint plausibly alleges that the fiduciaries could have acted without violating insider trading laws and could have concluded that it would be appropriate either to close the stock fund to new investments or to make the disclosures uh, that were suggested in the complaint without doing more harm than good, uh, which is, I, I think, a, a still a fairly steep standard for a plaintiff um, to meet at the pleading stage, but these are issues that the court left to the district courts uh, to sort out on a going forward basis.